All right. Hey guys, I'm Janet Liu. And I'm Sam Sands. And we're here to present on student leadership. So just a quick intro. As I said, I'm Janet. I'm the captain for 1678. And I'm also part of the hardware design sub team and I do competition strategy. So I'm Sam Sands. I am the vice captain of the team. I'm also on hardware design. I was the scout lead last year. I'm going to be uh, competition logistics this year. Yeah, so this presentation is going to be kind of short, but the whole purpose of it is at the end, we open it up to questions and discussions so you guys can all ask us things and we can try to answer them to the best of our capabilities. All right, so just a couple disclaimers. We are not experts or perfect, or perfect at what we do. We're trying to learn just like all of you guys are. And we are current student leaders on our team and we have been student leaders in the past. So I was strategy lead last year and Sam was a scout lead last year. And we are very passionate about our teams and a lot of this stuff that we talk about will be general, but specific also to our team. So we'll talk about kind of general um, things that can apply to all FRC teams, and then also how we implement those things on our specific team and kind of the structure that we have for 1678. But as we said before, 1678 isn't perfect, so things that work for us may not work for you guys and vice versa. So we talk a little bit about mission and vision. So the mission and vision of your team are very integral to your success, and the way that you as a student leader implement that is very important to your team succeeding. So first, your vision is your view for the future, and your mission is how you pursue your vision. So um, the vision of your team is something that you want to shape your team around. It's something that you want to use to um, push your students forward, push yourselves to your limit, and be able to perform at your best. And everything that your team does should always be able to link back to this mission and vision that you've set for yourself. Um, every goal that you set is a way of getting yourself closer to your mission and vision. All right, so on 1678, our mission statement and vision statements are pretty long. Our mission statement is, Team 1678 pursues our vision by building a student-led, mentor-based environment that fosters innovation and teaches interpersonal skills and technical skills. Citrus Circuits also develops local partnerships and community outreach while striving to compete at the highest level possible. So this kind of is the basis of our team. So everything we do reflects back to our mission statement. So our mentors are there to aid us in uh, and create kind of like a foster educational learning environment, but our team is student led. So we have a student leadership team that kind of um, sets the goals for our team and helps our team reach those goals. And um, we also have local partnerships with our sponsors and our community where we do outreach to reach out to these people and try to engage with the rest of our community. Our vision statement is we transform our communities through education. We engage people of all ages through outreach. We inspire others with a commitment to excellence. We strive to educate, empower, and excel. And once again, these three pillars are what we base our entire team structure around. And everything we do as a team works towards one or more of these, two, of these three pillars. So we're going to talk a little bit about our personal team structure. As Janet mentioned, this is how we do things. It's not necessarily how you should do things but it might be a good thing to take some inspiration from and see how you could apply it to the way that you want to run your team. So first, we have our core leadership. So that is Janet, myself, Steve Harvey, and Mike Corsetto. So uh, with uh, Steve Harvey being our head coach and Mike Corsetto being our lead technical mentor. So we're the uh, four people who, um, there's a lot of executive decisions and certain things that come directly to us, but we're part of a broader leadership team that our uh, team runs. So. Um, Next, we have our leadership uh, group as a whole. So kind of everything in this orange, uh, not orange, this uh, green box. Um, so that includes um, all of our technical sub teams, hardware fabrication, hardware design, hardware electrical, software robot and software scouting, as well as our um, business and media team, and also some extra sub teams that we have, uh, the chairman sub team and the strategy sub team. So amongst those, uh, those uh, groups, we have weekly leadership meetings that include a student representative, the student lead of each of those groups, Janet, myself, as well as three mentors. So that is when we um, air our thoughts about certain things that the team is working on, and that's kind of how our leadership team meets. Um, but there are sub teams who report to each of those leaders. So for every single uh, lead, there is a sub team of students who report to them, as well as there is a chairman's and strategy sub team, which students are a, can be a part of, but they're also a part of one of the other sub teams we listed. So um, even though I do design, I could be a member of strategy and I could work on how our team does strategy. Um, something that's not shown in this structure is how we do our outreach. So for each of our outreach efforts, just like fall workshops where, where you are right now, there was a student who was in charge of um, the fall workshops out, outreach project and they planned and they worked with other students to coordinate this. Um, our outreach leads, there's one for each one of our projects, don't necessarily have the same thing that we have with our uh, traditional leadership, where um, 
Instead, um, it's usually an individual who's doing a lot of the planning. And then when it comes to execution, then they call upon the students to be volunteers and participate and stuff. All right, so then even beyond this, we have a travel team that we bring to competitions. So obviously for this event specifically, because we're hosting it here in Davis, we don't have a travel team, but for events that are like um, Utah Regional or Champs or Matt Hunter Dan, we bring a travel team too. So our travel team is composed of these kind of main bullet points. We've got a pit team, a drive team, a scouting team, a citrus service team, and then a logistics person. So our pit team is the person who works in the pits. We typically have three students. This year, that would be a pit mechanical, pit electrical, and pit uh, robot programming. But this will vary depending on how our drive team is structured. Last year, we had two robot programmers on our drive team, so we didn't need a pit programmer. And this kind of just changes year to year as our drive team changes. Um, and these people are the people who are working in the pits, obviously, and they're fixing the robot as things break. And our drive team is drive coach, driver, operator, and then human player. And then these four people are technically not part of pit team, but they all travel down with pit team a day earlier ahead of events to help load in and set up for the next few days. And then we bring a scouting team. So this is typically around 18 to 24 people. And those scouting team are the people who are up in the stands. They're there watching the matches and taking data on everything that's going on. And the scouting team is really like where we get all of our data from. So when we do strategy, all of the decisions we make are based off of the scouting team. And our scouting team is particularly large. It's kind of unique in that sense. Um, so it takes a lot of effort from the efforts from the app programmers and the scout lead to help coordinate all of this and make sure everyone is on the same page on the scouting team. And then we've also got a citrus service team that does citrus service, which helps other teams during competitions. And then it's a group of four students and I think one mentor who's in charge of those four students. And they're around the pits. They've got these um, t-shirts on that say citrus service on them, and they're there to help people. And then lastly, we have one logistics person. This year, that's going to be Sam, who works with the parent chaperones to make sure everybody's on the same page. So Sam will coordinate things like when people get up, um, when meals and where meals are held, um, where the hotel is, coordinating driving between the hotel and the venue, and all stuff like that. Um, so we have a lead parent chaperone. This year, it's Amanda Young, who's in charge of doing um, organizing like all of that stuff. So she's the one who's doing hotel bookings. She's the person who brings all the parent drivers on and organizes the, like, the carpools. Um, so Sam has to work with her and the rest of the team and the mentors to make sure everyone is on the same page. So that all the students, regardless of what pit or drive team or scouting team they're on, they all know where to go and when, and so we don't lose any students. Um, so the travel team is always expanding. We started out, I think, like six students, and then we grew it to 20-something, and then 30-something, and this year, in the past year, it's been 44 students. And we're pretty unique in that sense. I know a lot of you guys probably don't have um, the group of students that we have because we just have a really big student body. So our student body is 96 students, and we try to bring as many of those 96 students as we can to competition. Um, the unique thing about our team is our school district makes it so that we have to pay for everybody's expenses. Um, who goes and travels with us. So our team has to, um, has to cover the travel expenses, the rooming expenses, and all the meals that our travel team does. So we're limited by that amount um, to determine how many students we can bring. And each year we try to expand that, but it's been a struggle because there's just so many students and it costs a lot of money to bring all of them to events. So next we're going to talk about cat herding. So kind of playing into the stuff we talked about, competitions. One of the most important things of being an effective student leader is being able to manage a large group of people. Um, so we have three main ways that we do that that we want to emphasize. So the first of those is using itineraries or other uh, scheduling systems, um, being flexible, and being a good communicator. Uh, so the first thing, itineraries, um, we are a uh, parent uh, travel coordinator, Amanda, uh, creates an itinerary for every single event that we attend. And that includes some basic information like schedules, like exactly what time we're going to wake up, what time we're going to go to this meal, what time we're going to get on the bus to travel between our hotel and the venue, the likes of that. But also includes other really important information, things like our hotel reservations, um, our meal reservations, how we're get, which kind of transportation we're going to use, if we're doing something like carpooling, how the carpooling is going to work out. All of that information we keep consolidated, and we do our best to stick to as tight of a schedule as we can because it makes us being that efficient is something that um, makes sure that we're able to uh, meet all of our times. Um, but then kind of going off of that, you're not always going to be able to fit to that schedule. That's just not how it works. Even if how, as well as you make an itinerary in advance, things are going to come up and it's not going to work out exactly as you anticipated. So even more important when managing a large group of people is being able to be flexible. Um, 
things are going to come up. You're going to be blindsided by them. So being able to make those changes on the fly in a high pressure situation like a competition uh, is really important to being a good student leader. And then the last thing, which is something we're going to emphasize later in this presentation, but we really want to stress it, is being a good communicator. Because being a good communicator as a student leader doesn't mean being the loudest person in the room. It means being someone who is clear, someone who's concise, and someone who conveys information well, so it really reaches the students. All right, so then we're going to transition to our team handbook. So our team has a team handbook that basically details all of our rules and expectations for all of our students. Um, so things we cover in it can be policies like our attendance policy, um, our behavioral standards, but it can also include things like how we select leadership or how we select travel team. And all of this stuff is explicitly written out in our team handbook, so there is no confusion between us as leadership students, the mentors, and the rest of our student body. Um, so we really stress having clear rules and expectations and consequences for not meeting those rules or expectations. So for us, that could be like, if you're not meeting 75% of your attendance, um, then we will have a talk with you. And if that continues up, you will be asked to leave the team. Or it could be if you're not wearing closed-toed shoes, you're going to be sent home and asked to return with closed-toed shoes on. And this can be different for all of your guys' teams. But we really think it's a good idea to have this just so there's not going to be any backlash when you enact the consequence and a student is like, well, I didn't know that was a rule, so therefore I'm exempt from it or something like that. So it just makes it really explicit what they're expected to know and expected to learn and expected to act. And then this is also for the sake of transparency. So you don't ever want to have a leadership group that's kind of closed off and like a clique of its own. You always want to have a leadership group that's um, clearly communicating your um, decisions and your discussions with the rest of the student body. Especially with someone with a team as big as ours where we have like a 96 to like 14 leadership, um, student to leadership ratio. It's important to make sure that those 14 students don't like kind of act like a clique in the views of the rest of the 96 students. And then at the very end of the, our team handbook, we have a student contract. So that's basically just a contract that says, I've read this thing, and I understand that I'm supposed to ex um, follow and meet these expectations. And I understand that not meeting these expectations will result in these consequences. And this is basically just kind of for peacekeeping, where if a student is ever like, well, I didn't know this was a thing, you can say, well, you read the student handbook, and here's a student contract that proves you read it. So you should know this um, expectation. Next, we're going to talk a little bit more about communication, which I touched on earlier. So um, for communication, you're responsible for being clear and for following up on what you communicate. So I, I said it before, but um, a good communicator is not someone who's the loudest person, but it's the person who's the clearest person. Because being a leader is about conveying information and making sure that it's not falling on deaf ears. So being a clear communicator and not being, like, being, being kind, being someone who um, communicates in a manner where you're not yelling at them, but you're, you're telling them something, even if it has to be loud. Um, but being a good communicator goes both ways. So um, you don't uh, want to just spit a bunch of information at the people that you're leading. You don't want to just fill them with a bunch of uh, nonsense. But you want to have that back and forth between them. Having a, being able to have an open dialogue with uh, the students that you're leading is incredibly important. So being able to answer questions, allowing for people to give you feedback, that kind of thing, is also really important to being a good communicator. And then, so for our communication specifically, we're going to talk about uh, Slack and email. So for our team, we try to do the majority of our communication through Slack. Um, we have Slack channels that are specific to our sub teams, to our outreach groups, to other things during build season, like um, like when meetings are going to happen and the like. So for us, we use Slack because it's a good consolidated form of information sharing. Um, but also compared to email, it's something that students are more likely to look at. So just kind of touch on email for a second. We use email to send out large team communication, like announcements for events and um, things that are going to concern students and parents as a whole. But a lot of times, students aren't necessarily going to be responsible enough to check their email. So if you have a medium like Slack or if you wanted to use something like Discord or another uh, message sharing service, it's something that it's more likely that your students are going to be um, keeping up to date with. Um, another thing that's really nice about Slack is it does have, even though we use channels whenever we can, it does have direct messages. So trying to keep all your information or, or, uh, between students on one platform does make it a lot easier to keep it uh, together. And one thing that we try to do, even though we do use direct messages for communication between students, is when certain things uh, are shared, like if, I, if I'm a student and I design something and I want some critique from my peers, it's 
I could just send a message to a mentor. I could meet with them in person and have them go over the design with me. But then that's only a learning experience for myself. Being able to um, put that information out there using a public channel like Slack means that the critiques you're receiving or the information that you're getting is something that could be a learning experience for everybody, not just for yourself. All right, so we're gonna talk about planning and scheduling. So for us, we have a couple meetings, obviously, every week, and then we have schedules and we have announcements that clear up all of these meetings. So for our team specifically, we have leadership meetings, we have general meetings, and then we have extra meetings. So general meetings are our 6.30 to 9 meetings on Wednesdays and Thursdays each week that every single student is expected to attend. So these are mandatory for attendance, and there is no question about it. Obviously, we allow people to have like excused absences if there's extra extenuating circumstances, but those have to be clearly communicated. Um, in addition to our regular meetings, we also have leadership meetings, which are only for the leadership team and the leadership mentors. And those are gonna be about an hour and a half before one of our general meetings. So we meet once a week for leadership, and at these leadership meetings, we go over kind of general team discussions. So this could be anything from like team attitude to team culture. It could include things like, which events are we going to this year? Or how, we, how far are we prepared for our off-season robot? All that kind of stuff is discussed at these leadership meetings with the rest of this leadership body. And this is kind of a good area for each representative from each sub-team to air their thoughts and kind of all come to a conclusion. So never is one decision made just by like one person on our team. It's always a communication, like it's always a discussion between a group of students and a group of mentors to decide things. So there's no like dictatorship of one student who's like, oh, I'm in charge and I'm gonna make all the decisions. It's always a group discussion. And then we have extra meetings. So Sam talked about one of our Slack channels. It's actually called Meeting Supervisors where we ask for mentors who are free to supervise the shop for us when we need extra meeting time. Um, and these extra meetings are always communicated through Slack for specific sub-teams. So the app programming team might say, oh, we need an extra meeting on a Saturday. And then a mentor might say, oh, I can stop up to do that. And then the app programming sub-team lead will communicate with the rest of the students. Um, there will be a meeting at this time. You are expected to be there. And all of our leadership and regular meetings are on our team calendar. So we have a Google calendar that um, says all of our specific events and meetings. So this could be anywhere from coming to CCC, um, from our regular Wednesday, Thursday meetings. It could be a WAD pan, a work all day play on night that we have on a specific Saturday. It could be something like um, the farmer's market outreach that we do every Wednesday and uh, Saturday. And then all this stuff is put on the Google Calendar. So anytime a student asks us, oh, when is the next team meeting, we can reference the Google Calendar and tell them to look there instead of asking us. It kind of helps clear up any sort of com confusion where you have like 15 students asking you the same question. You can just say, look at the calendar. And then we also have team announcements at the, be at the beginning of all of our general announcements. So those are made by me and Sam, and they're just there for clarity. So at team announcements, we discuss really like upcoming events. So that could be like a WAD pan, that could be coming to CCC, it could be what we review during leadership meetings. All that kind of stuff is what we talk about at announcements. And this is in part for clarity because all the students are gonna be there so you know all the students are receiving your message and also for transparency. So we talk about our leadership meetings at the announcements where we discuss kind of what we went through at leadership. And this kind of helps clear things out for um, all the students where the students will know, oh, we discussed X, Y, Z things at the leadership meeting this Wednesday. So next we're gonna talk about team culture and respect. So um, one of the things that's really important uh, to having a healthy team culture is having a culture of respect. So um, we try to emphasize that uh, our leaders are gonna respect the students and the students are gonna respect their leaders because we want an environment where every single student respects each other. Um, but then part of being a uh, leader is being a model student for that culture and for that environment that you're trying to create. So we expect all of our leaders to be professional, to be responsible, to be positive and to be transparent. So the first one, uh, being professional, kind of like with respect, we expect all of our students to treat things they do as the team, just like they were in a professional environment. Um, to act maybe not like it's just like you're out with your friends, but our team is, should, wants that professional culture where students act like they would in a normal working environment. Um, we have, make sure our leaders are responsible. I mean, that's the pretty key part of being a leader, but being responsible for stuff and not letting things slide. Um, being positive, um, I mean, if you, if you are the leader, act positive, and your students see you acting positive, they're more likely to act positive than if you're all down and dreary. That's not really gonna help their mood when you're at meetings. And then being transparent. So we kind of talked about uh, the thing with the leadership notes. Uh, we share those at, uh, to our team and doing everything we can to make sure that 
the leaders don't feel separated from the students, to make it feel the students feel like the leaders are there to represent them. They're there to make sure that their interests are heard at our leadership meetings, at the decisions we make, not that the leaders are on some high horse and that they're calling all the shots themselves. And then uh, for, cult, uh, for team culture, uh, I kind of mentioned it before, but we really want uh, a healthy team culture. We want our students to respect each other. We want our students to have a good time, and we want to make sure that the culture of our team is about having fun and respecting others. You have some more to add? Yeah, so going back to respect, I know it's kind of cliche to say this, or it's like it's really hard to gain respect. Like it's hard to gain it and really easy to lose respect. And part of what makes you um, gain the respect from your peers and from the students you work with and the mentors you work with is your attitude during these meetings. So a lot of just becoming a leader starts from just the basic thing basic things like working in the shop alongside a friend or something like that. Um, always being positive and professional in these situations kind of helps you gain this sort of respect. And there is no key way to say if you do X, Y, Z things, you will gain respect because that's not true. It's really all down to your specific situation and how you are as a person. But as like a rule of thumb, if you're a kind person who's there and willing to be a good listener for your peers, they're more likely to respect you. So kind of having this um, back and forth between you as a student leader and your actual students that you're working with is really important to gaining this respect and keeping it all throughout your meetings. So a lot of this comes down to just when you're, you know, your daily actions at the shop or something like that. During these interactions, maintaining a positive, like, positive attitude, maintaining um, like a good listening attitude where you're willing to be someone who's there to take questions, take constructive criticism, have feedback, all that sort of stuff is really important to getting respect. Okay, so then we're going to talk about the Google Drive. So this is how we organize our team virtually. So we use um, this thing called G Suite. So it's basically a team drive where everyone is, has access to a team drive. So a team drive is shared between a bunch of different people, and it can, you can easily revoke access for people who are no longer on the team. And the reason we use this is this kind of helps clears up um, succession from year to year to year. So for us, we use Google Groups um, to maintain sort of our emails, where we have all the students part of one Google group, we have all the parents as part of another one, and all the leaders and all the mentors, et cetera, are each part of their own Google group. So when we use a team drive, we add the Google group and not the individual students. So that way, when students leave the team or they, you know, they graduate, something like that, we can just update the Google group with the new student body, and then we have a updated team drive. And we found a lot of, we started, we transitioned to this, I think, last year, because the year before that, we had a lot of issues where we had shared specific files with, te with people from other teams. And then those people ended up having access to our entire team drive, which had a lot of sensitive information. So we had also a lot of alumni who became mentors for other teams, and they still had access to our drives because they were still added to specific links or specific files. Um, so having a team drive kind of negates all of this, um, these issues, um, especially since as an owner, even if you own a file and you create it in a team drive, when you leave that team drive, you no longer have access to that file, which is really important, especially when you have like people who end up um, graduating and going elsewhere. And then we also share all of our documentation on these team drives. So obviously for Google Drive, you have things like Google Documents or slides or um, spreadsheets, stuff like that. Um, so all of these like itineraries that we talked about earlier are debriefs for competitions and um, other spreadsheets like strategy spreadsheets or parts tracking spreadsheets. They're all on our team drive where they can be easily seen by everyone. Um, yeah, so then, for yeah, so basically one of the key things is just avoid direct link sharing, and that's what a team drive helps you with. Because if you direct link share to somebody, then they're going to have access to that link even when they leave the team. So we try to avoid that as much as possible. So next we're going to talk about succession and future leaders. So that includes identifying potential, avoiding favoritism, training, and applications and nominations. So first, uh, what we look for in a leader. Um, we when we're uh, seeing new prospective students who might be interested in taking on a leadership position in the following year, we're looking for students who are really dedicated, students who put in that extra effort. And that's part of kind of initiative as well. So students who show that they're committed and they put in the time and then they put in that extra time more than a lot of other students are willing to. Um, and then another thing is attitude. So I mentioned before with positivity, um, when you're looking at uh, students who could be prospective leaders, you want students who have the attitude that you're looking for on your team, students that you think will be that model student, will be the student that helps uh, keep your team culture the way you want it to be. But then kind of in line with that is avoiding favoritism. So, um, and I'll talk about this a little later, but we don't want just our outgoing leaders to handpick some other students to be leaders because 
that doesn't fit into the transparency that we're trying to achieve. And that isn't really fair to a lot of students. So um, kind of skipping a step, but we do a nomination and interview process for all of our leaders. Um, at uh, round right after champs, uh, students are open to uh, write a nomination for themselves, for any student on the team, for any leadership, outreach or normal team leadership and um, nominate them for that position. They could you know, write some things why they think they would be a, a good leader and why they'd be a good fit. And then after we have all those nominations, uh, the outgoing leadership team, so uh, the core leadership, goes over all that information that was sent in, and they use that to help uh, uh, to approach some students and ask them. Uh, so every student that is nominated is asked if they want to interview for that position. And then once those students are interviewed, we, we have a series of questions that um, correspond pretty well to the area that they've been nominated to be a leader in. And based on that, we deliberate and we ultimately decide on some students that we think would be best fit for those positions. Um, but then uh, for training, um, so kind of anecdotally, when I, when I, in my second year on the team, uh, I was asked if I wanted to do an outreach position. I, and I took on, I was the event coordinator for our Davis Youth Robotics program. And for me, that was a, a lot of personal growth and being able to be in a leadership position, even though it was at a smaller scale, uh, ended up making me really interested in the leadership of our team. And ultimately, I interviewed and became the vice captain of our team. So in our case, uh, we try to use other smaller leadership opportunities as kind of a stepping stone. So students who are interested in leadership can pursue those and then potentially in the future when they're a little bit older or they've shown that personal growth, that's a really great chance to step up as a leader in your team. Sweet, so I think that's the end of our presentation. We just wanna open this up to discussion. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask us now or you can approach us afterwards. So are there any questions? Yeah. I have a quick clarification on that last slide. Yeah. Um, so students pick the successors um, as their leaders or is it, is, is it all students pick? Okay, so what happens is we have initial student nominations for anyone on the team and then um, the core leadership. So that would be myself, Sam, Mike, and Harvey. So it's a group of both mentors and okay. students that do it. Yeah, so there are two lead mentors and then students. Yeah. Back there. Yeah, so there are graduating vice captain and captain who are picking the rest of the core leadership team for the next year. Yeah, um, in the blue. We typically don't have that issue um, because our team is just so big, but we don't have any like set rules for, oh, only a senior can be captain or vice captain. So it really kind of depends on how the, the cards fall and who the students are for a specific year. And we don't really look at the grade levels when we're deciding who's gonna be the next leaders. Yeah. So kind of related to this, I was asking about your guys' platform. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an issue with um, like off topic conversations mm -hmm. on our yeah. And we've been really trying to like rein in that sort of off topic conversation. Have you guys had that issue? And so, like, how do you deal with it? So, we have another channel that's specifically for off topic discussion. So, it's number nine random, which is essentially a platform for you to just say whatever you want, really. And you can like share pictures, you can share videos that aren't relevant to the team. Um, but we just, in the very beginning of our team, uh, like our team season, we have a presentation about Slack where we really emphasize being professional on it. And every time we see a student who's like off task, especially in a public channel, like the mentors or the leadership team or any student really will just say, please keep it on task, be professional. And then once they've got that warning, they, they normally kind of register and they're like, okay, I should probably not say weird things on a public channel. Yeah. Back there. Okay, so for a sub team specifically, um, what typically happens is during the interview, the core leadership runs the interviews, but we invite the past sub team lead to be in that interview and ask any questions. So the past sub team lead can give us input about a specific student, and then we take that input into consideration and we make our final decision. We don't actually do any other um, FRC programs. We work with a program called VEX IQ. I don't know if you know it, um, but it's kind of like FRC. It's just for youths. So it's kind of like Lego, 
but then the competitions change each year. Um, so we, our Davis Youth Robotics Program works really closely with that in the sense that we have um, family-run programs that like are coached by D uh, Davis parents who coach their own team and then we host a competition for them. But we also have school programs with the Vex IQ platform where we provide mentors and stuff for the school programs. And so we use, we use Vex, but we don't, we used to use FLL and then it just was too expensive for people here. So we just stopped using it. Anything else? Yeah, back there. How do you, as a student leader, deal with oh, students who like, aren't as motivated or won't like, meet deadlines or are like, deliberately avoiding doing actual like, immature uh, members? Yeah. So uh, I think we mentioned our student handbook. There are specific uh, repercussions for a lot of things. And not, um, not being an active member of the team does fall under that. So we, since we had students sign the student contract, we do hold them accountable for the fact that they said that they were going to be on task and they were going to put in that work. Uh, but for us specifically, because we have a large body of students, it's a little bit, it might be a little bit easier right, to um, like give students such a harsh repercussion as removal from the team. But I mean, uh, if, if you don't have that kind of uh, thing that you can, um, pun I don't want to say punish, but I mean, that's a little bit of what it is, then it is, I, I can see how it's tough. Yeah. Um, for us specifically, for our attendance system, we have an unproductive, so that counts against their attendance. So even if they're there physically at the meeting, if they're not being productive, if they're off task or they're distracting other students, then we mark them unproductive. And that, like, as like, the head of the team, walk around and like, people regularly? We don't normally like check in necessarily. Um, we have a general, like each sub team has a general meeting at the beginning where the sub team lead is delegating tasks or they're checking in with students to say, oh, how is this project going? But typically the sub team lead is a person who's actively involved in the work. So they'll be working with all of these students already on their own. So they'll know in their general kind of actions, you know, how they perform. Um, and then we also have a three strike policy, which is essentially um, three warnings. And then after three warnings, you're off the team. So the first one is just like, if you're unproductive, you're asked to leave. And the second time that happens, you're asked to leave and we tell your parents. And then the third time is your last chance, essentially. Um, and I know it's really harsh, but because we just have so many students, it's actually something we can, you know, enact. Um, but honestly, like, if your students are being unproductive, I think the best way is just to approach them about it and then just um, enact kind of, kind of harsh consequences to deal with that. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, so a lot of it is just leaving the meeting and ask to come back the next meeting. And then that's like that's kind of just the stepping stones. And then after that, it's going to be leaving the meeting, talking to your parents. And after that, it's removal from the team. Anything else? Yeah. How do you make sure that students have things to do at meetings? Sometimes we have this problem where we have too many people um, and not enough tasks. Yeah. Do you want to answer that? Or do you want me to? Well, um, one thing uh, that we've done is we have our, the size of our team has shrunk a little bit. Um, we did an application process this year and that brought our team down from what had been 135, 100, 135 to 96. To 96. Um, I guess part of it though is um, we do try to do like, it, it, it happens in build season especially, I'm assuming is, is where you've had that problem. And we've had that problem too. And a lot of times there are a lot of idle hands. So um, we, our sub team leads to an extent try to um, come up with opportunities that may not be related directly to robot work to help benefit the students. Like if you're a programmer and maybe the, the code, I'm not going to say the code's finished, but there's, there's too many people and there's not enough, not all of them can work on the robot code, maybe have them do some online coding classes. Or for design, um, even if there's, everybody's working on the robot design, but there are some idle hands, we've designed some other things that are not robot related. Like we've designed some other things for, for practice or even for our own use. So coming up with things that aren't necessarily busy work, but are things that need to be get done, got, that you need to ha be finished, even if they're not exactly with the robot. Yeah. And kind of along those lines too, especially since for us, we have a big group of new students each year. What we end up doing is having about like two or three new students shadow each veteran member. So it's kind of a group of people working on one project specifically. And that kind of helps take off the load of having so many hands you can't work with. How long would that Yeah, so we always use off season for our training. So right now is like prime time for us to really teach our students, you know, how to use the machines or how to code, et cetera, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's when they're like, they're really just learning on their own. Like they'll go through on shape tutorials or I know 
follow along with the homeworks for um, programming. Um, but during the season, it's less shadowing and more just like a collaborative group of people where you have like one or two veteran members in charge and then helping teach these new members how to design or how to program something. Yeah. yeah. So for us specifically, it was our first year doing it this year, so it was really new. Um, but the way it worked is each student had to fill out a form that's like an application form. And if you're a new student, that requires a teacher recommendation. So you have to get a teacher recommendation and complete some short answer questions as well as some like logistic questions. Um, and then re returning students also had to do this form. And for returning students, they don't have to do the teacher nomination or teacher, um, what do you call it? Like recommendation. recommendation, yeah. Um, and then after that, we interviewed every single one of our applicants. So I think it was either me and Sam or me and Mike or somebody. There was always around two people interviewing each student. And our interview questions kind of were really the deciding point on whether or not we would take the student. Um, so for returning members, it was in questions like, what are you most proud of doing on the team? Or what do you hope to contribute in the future? Stuff like that that's really team specific because we've already known they've had a year or two to grow on our team. Um, and for new students, it's more like, um, what do you hope to do on the team? Or what are you excited about? Or what have you learned? Or what past experience with robotics have you had? Questions like those that are more just to gauge their personality as a worker and how dedicated they are to robotics. Um, and then after that, it was a decision made by CORE where we all kind of sat, to get, sat down and went through the 135 students and were like, do we want them or do we not want them on the team? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you guys handle that? Answer. Well, um, I, I, it is a problem, and that that continue. I mean, that's been a problem for us recently. Um, I, I guess the best thing to do is if you do have other mean communication, like if if your students habitually do not check Slack, it, it might be a good idea to have some have their phone number so you can call them because we do try to keep everything on Slack. But if somebody doesn't show up to one of our trainings, well, that means that we have. We, brought a person there to, to work with them on a machine and that's wasting their time. So we do our best to have other modes of communication to contact them. And then also kind of going back to the holding people accountable thing. Um, if you don't follow up on things, um, because we mentioned with uh, selecting our travel team, that doesn't necessarily, because um, our, we're, we're looking at uh, 96 students for 44 spots, things like not being responsible and not feeling like you're accountable for things doesn't reflect well on you. So for us, one of the repercussions there would be maybe not being considered for travel team. Any other questions? Yeah. So how did your team deal with burnout? Like having, sort of having your team get like overwhelmed with work to the point where it's getting us unmotivated? Honestly, because we have 96 students, that doesn't really happen. <laughs> because we just have so many like opportunities for people. Like it's normally the opposite problem where we have just too many, too many hands and too few things to do. Um, but I don't know, I'm just like kind of spitballing here. Maybe you could do, we have like team bonding activities where we kind of, where instead of doing like something just pure work, we do something fun where it's kind of like a relief from all of the hectic, just busy work that we do during build season. Um, so maybe doing something like that could be a good way to help alleviate that. I don't know, do you have any? So I would think this kind of goes back to what we said about positivity and the environment you build on your team. If you have people who are energetic and they kind of instill that, um, like that positive vibe, then maybe that's, gonna help you out and maybe that'll make those students more incentivized. Yeah. Um, do you guys do specific trainings for your leaders? So actually this year we had a leadership retreat. It was just at someone's house, but we had one of our um, parents who like, um, he does psychology. psychology, yeah, for like a professional psychologist. Um, he came in and just kind of had a talk with the entire leadership group. So that was all the students and the three mentors involved. And it was kind of like a discussion about how to be a good leader what it means to lead well, and then also kind of just general positivity or like team bonding activities that we did as a group. Um, so this, wait, the question was how to be a good leader. Okay, um, so this kind of really gives, gave the leadership an opportunity to bond as a group and really kind of get more to know each other, but also it was just like helpful to learn um, from a professional, you know, what are the trade secrets or how do you be a good leader? Yeah. Anybody else? All right, cool. Um, we'll be up here for a while, so if you have any questions that you didn't get answered, you guys can just approach us. Um, you can also email us anytime. And then here, we've got a QR code. If you guys want to give us any feedback about how we could improve this presentation, feel free to do so. Yeah? 
Thanks for coming. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks.